All right. Good morning, Four Oaks Church. It's Pastor Paul. It's Monday, April 10th, post-Easter, post-Masters, post all of that stuff. So glad to be back with you. Of course, we took last week off getting ready for Easter, Good Friday, Holy Week, but now we are digging back into the Word of God here on a Monday morning in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, because we're always having new folks join and um, check out what's happening on this pastoral podcast, probably be helpful as we're getting going again to rehearse what we're doing, why we're doing it, what our ultimate goal is every morning. So the, the goal, again, is not to just dispense theological, biblical information, um, although that's part of what we're doing. The goal, actually, is to help you learn to interpret the Bible, study the Bible, apply the Bible yourself, for yourself, to be a self-feeder. And the way that we're doing that is we are looking at the passage that's coming up that coming Sunday that we're going to be preaching on on Sunday mornings. And so that way, as I'm working through the passage, as you're working through the passage, we're all working together, right? And you're sort of getting a glimpse into some of the ways that that I approach biblical interpretation. I'm trying to drop some some tools, some resources your way as we as we walk through it together. And that's the ultimate goal. Now, we are back in the Sermon on the Mount, and we are going to be looking at this week, verses 17 through 20 of chapter 5. All right, so let me read those verses and then tell you why this is a particularly important, significant, and I think even helpful passage for us to be looking at together. So Matthew 5, 17, Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, truth and advertising, as we get ready to dig into these four verses this week, there may be no other singular passage that Jesus talks about, maybe with the exception of um, the, the, the last discourse that he, that he gives in Matthew on, on the end of the age and those sorts of things. That, that one's pretty hotly contested, but this one might be even the most hotly contested in all of Matthew. And there has been no amount of ink spilled that would do it justice, right? There's a lot here, and it's a great passage for us to dig into because just, again, truth in advertising, I have not done a lot of prep work for this passage. In fact, I'm coming at it sort of raw and fresh like you are. It doesn't mean that I haven't studied it in previous times or um, I didn't read it before we got on the air this morning, but it does mean that it gives us an opportunity, you an opportunity to show sort of how I approach a text like this and using some of the tools that we've talked about. So, so two tools that we've discussed here. One is this idea of concentric circles. So if we think about that the meaning of the sermon or the meaning of a, a, a message should be the meaning of the text, the point of the text, that's the innermost circle. And as we expand out in rings of circles, um, we are getting into things like context and how does it flow in the context of Matthew and what is, what is the overall purpose of the Sermon on the Mount and those, and those sorts of things. So that's the, that's, that's the concentric circle piece. And then there's also the piece of what comes before and what comes after, okay? So I want to look at those two pieces because we dare not rush like a bull in a china shop into the text this week unless we really properly situate it. Because if you read this text in isolation, it can lead you in places that are entirely unhealthy, entirely unbiblical, entirely, dare I say it, heretical, if we don't 
understand the big picture. So, so let's start with the big picture and the context first, okay? So obviously, Matthew's theme we've talked about is this idea of the kingdom of heaven and that Jesus is King Jesus and that everything in Matthew's gospel is meant to communicate that reality, that in fact, as he's writing to um, Christian Jews, Jewish Christians, and also Jews that aren't Christians, this is probably some 60 AD or something Matthew's writing, his goal is to show that, in fact, Jesus is the long-awaited, long-hoped-for Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, prophecies predicting such. And, and everything that he's doing, of course, is pointing to that. Jesus is his lineage, his history, um, how, how he was anointed as king by John the Baptist, and how he's been proclaiming the kingdom and gathering up people. Well... When we get to the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard us say before that this is, in essence, Jesus's vision for the good life. Not just any good life, but the good life in heaven, the, the life of blessedness, the life of flourishing. Jesus, here in these opening 13 verses, okay, which we've been, I'm sorry, the opening 15 verse, 16 verses, has, has, has this is Jesus' prolegomena, right, to the sermon. He's going to give us a vision of kingdom living, but he wants to show us that, in fact, this, it's an almost like an apologetic, that, that by committing ourselves to this way of living and following Jesus, we are on the path of flourishing. And that we are, as we are doing that, we are functioning as salt and light as we are pursuing these beatitudes. Well, in 17, um, well, it, actually, if you get down to verse 21, um, you'll see if you have a study Bible, um, it'll have certain headings over the text from here henceforth. Anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, love your enemies, giving to the needy, etc., etc., etc. This, in essence, is the meat of the sermon. This is where Jesus begins to exposit and explain and teach what exactly this life in the kingdom is is supposed to look like. In other words, as we are embracing the Beatitudes, what does that look like in the context of relationships? What does it look like in the context of giving or when we have an issue with our brother or sexuality or marriage or those sorts of things? And, and so Jesus has, has, has done that, has, has issued that invitation in 1 through 16, and we know that following in the sermon is sort of the, the guts of that. All right, the, what does it mean to live life on mission for Jesus? Now, verses 17 through 20 are absolutely fundamentally crucial because they are going to tell us how we are to understand what Jesus is going to say, okay? Um, they're going to help us contextualize everything that he's saying from this time forth. But if we don't get these four verses right, um, Think about it this way, and you may have, I think you may have heard, this is not my analogy is what I'm trying to say. So, so if, if, if you were calculating um, a blast-off orbit for a, um, a rocket, okay, and we know how important um, mathematical equations and trajectories and those sorts of things, you could be off just one minuscule calculation off a, a, a millimeter of a degree, right? And when you blast off, that millimeter doesn't make much of a difference. But as time goes on and that rocket continues to go into the air and accelerate quickly, that degree, that degree of error begins to multiply exponentially. And that's what can happen if we're off even a degree or two um, to what Jesus is saying. Okay, So I'm going to be giving you some homework to do between now and tomorrow because here's some things that jump out immediately that we need to try to, to grasp, okay? So what does Jesus mean when he says he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them? It seems that that's an important precursor because what Jesus is going to teach about the law, how to rightly interpret the law, apply the law, the kingdom law, um, 
he's anticipating that he might be accused of abolishing the law or might be accused of teaching something that's not in the Old Testament or making his own law. And what Jesus wants to make it very clear is that what he is about to do in the remainder of the sermon is in fact consistent with the Old Testament law, its prophecies, and its fulfillment, okay? That's important because who was it that's going to um, attack Jesus the most when it came to what he did in his ministry? Well, it was, the, it was the Pharisees. It was the experts in the law. And Jesus is preparing the people for the fact that what he is about to teach is not just not inconsistent, but it's in fact a fulfillment of the way the Old Testament law should be applied for the New Testament believer. And you see this, look down at verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is, is putting his stakes in the ground. Not only is he here to rightly interpret the law, but he's telling the people that in whatever way the law has been interpreted by the Pharisees up to this point has been inadequate. In other words, they think they've been righteous, they think they've been um, wholehearted in obeying the commands of God, but they have been anything but. And so Jesus is signaling to them, however the Pharisees have been interpreting this for you, however they've been living it out, one, what I'm about to tell you is the right teaching, is the right fulfillment, and it will lead you to a place where your righteousness will, must exceed that of the Pharisees. Now, one thing to, to, to dig into, I would encourage you to dig into this week or tonight, uh, anticipation of our devotionals, is this word righteousness, okay? We talked about this um, at the beginning of um, the sermon, but remember, righteousness, there, there's different ways to use the word righteousness, but here, um, Jesus is not referring to what what the kind of righteousness Paul was talking about. So Paul was talking about forensic righteousness or righteousness that's alien to us, that's credited to our account, that God treats us as righteous even though we're not experientially righteous. That's not the kind of righteousness Jesus is speaking of, is, of here. Jesus is speaking of wholehearted behavior where the inside and the outside match, not where there's perfection, but where there is consistency, where there is wholeness, where there is a, a sturdiness, a constancy. And so as we're getting ready to, to unpack this particular passage this week, I think it would be your assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to go through and look at the different times Matthew uses the word righteousness, okay? You can do this on a computer program, software. You, can, you, can, you don't have to have that, though. You, I mean, you can Google it, but you can look in the back of your study Bible, okay? And every time it says the word righteous in Matthew, go and look and read and see what the context is. And I think what you will discover, Jesus is not saying that the Pharisees are doing awesome, and in order for you to, be, to, to get to heaven, you've got to de be even more awesomer, right? Totally made that word up. That's not what it means, right? It means that the Pharisees behavior is anything but wholehearted. And that's God's intention in giving us the law of the kingdom. So that's some homework for you. And as you do that, I think this passage will, as we move through the week, will start to come into a little clearer view because we want to understand what does it mean that Jesus came to, to, to not to abolish, but to fulfill a, the law. Um, what does it mean relaxing the least of these commandments? Okay, what what in what way does our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees? These are all good questions that we're going to get to, but we got to get the big picture established first. So go to it. Um, we'll be back here tomorrow, and my prayer for you and me is that regardless of where we find ourselves today, that God would empower us with His Holy Spirit to wholehearted living. Okay, um, not to earn our salvation but to be congruent with the work of God's Spirit in our life, to please Him and to honor Him. Lord, that, that is our prayer. We want to be wholehearted people. We want to be those who 
hold up the values of the kingdom and the way that we live and to follow you, Jesus, and to imitate you. But Lord, you know our sinfulness, our hard-heartedness, our dullness of heart, and so we need your help. We need your mercy, your grace, your spirit. We ask these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen.